thank you and thank you organizers for um, inviting me here. I'm going to start by pointing out that in the year 2000, The Economist described Africa as the hopeless continent. In 2013, the same magazine described Africa as a hopeful continent. Today, I'm calling for more hope. I'm calling for more differences that we can be proud of. So the big question is, what are the differences that will make Africa's hopes into reality? In 2002, my son fell ill with a fever and difficulty breathing. When I took him to hospital, they tested him for both malaria and pneumonia. In 24 hours, the lab confirmed that he had a case of severe malaria and also had a bacterial chest infection. My son is now a 15-year-old, vibrant, strong boy. However, in those 10 years, at least 3 million children in Africa have had a much tougher road. Many of them present to hospital and at least 40 to 50 of their infections remain undiagnosed. The reasons for this are many. Firstly, in most sub-Saharan African hospitals, the lab facilities do not have the capacity to diagnose many of our infections. Secondly, even if they have the capacity to diagnose the infections, the cost is way too high. This leaves doctors with the limited um, capacity to make um, diagnosis, and the doctors then have to make their best educated guess. The short-term and long-term effects of this are many. Last year alone, 292,000 children died of undiagnosed infections in Africa. In the long term, doctors do prescribe antibiotics where sometimes it's not necessary. And now we're left fighting both infection and evolution because of antibiotic resistance that is developing and accelerating on the continent. There is a third issue and a third difference that I would really like to see us make in terms of child mortality. Undernutrition. A million children die from malnutrition every year globally. And while Africa has made great gains in health research, 50% of those deaths are in sub-Saharan Africa. Children who are malnourished have quite a few problems. Firstly, they get very many infections and where they, they are treated, they also re, um, return with recurring infections. Their counterparts who are well nourished have a five um, five times better chance of surviving their infections. When we diagnose these children, we have many challenges. We cannot take enough blood sometimes to repeat the tests that need to be done to ensure that we give them the targeted treatment that we can. I therefore think we need to do better. We need to work hard to ensure that these children get the targeted treatment that they need. So, like many of us here in the audience, I went to the UK to do my um, PhD research. There, I trained to extract proteins from a spot of blood to be able to and, um, tell me what infections children who didn't have um, a diagnosis had. I looked at children who had cerebral malaria and compared them with those who had bacterial meningitis and I also managed to get some biomarkers that effectively told us what some children who had no diagnosis before had. <clears throat> Importantly, I could bypass one of the classical tests that we use, um, culture. That test takes 48 hours to get results. And as mentioned, these children need to be treated very quickly. So now I have a test that takes shorter. We can get this result from a spot of blood in a much shorter time. However, while working in the UK, I had the benefit of working with um, great technicians, I had great reagents, but the th one thing I was never sure of is that these samples that I had taken from Kenya to Kilifi and back, whether the, the results were based on the fact that they'd been stored longer or they had um, degraded due to being thawed. So I always wondered whether I, got, I would get the same results from fresh samples. I then chose to come back to Kenya 
and I was lucky enough to get some funding to be able to bring the same technologies that I used in the UK. Yes, we do have challenges trying to run this lab in Kilifi, Kenya. It is a much smaller lab than I was used to, and it sometimes takes too long to get the reagents that I need. But importantly, I think the gains we've made in terms of being able to train more local scientists are great. Secondly, I can assess samples right from the field without having to worry about whether I need to freeze them and ship them to, to the UK ETC. And, in, and thirdly, I can work where the patients are and I can work where the babies we need to save are. <coughs> However, my lab needs engineers. We need to be able to service the machines that we have brought here in, um, to Kenya. I also need mathematical modelers to help me an analyze the large data sets that I collect. In the UK, I could walk into the next department and have an array of people helping me with these things. So I am passionate about the fact that we need to enhance the STEM-related sciences for health research in Africa to ensure work like, that, like mine is accelerated here in Africa. A point I also want to see, a difference we need to make, is the fact that the knowledge we generate is very, um, we, have, we still have a very wide gap when we compare that knowledge to commercialization. The whole week we've heard governments talk about the support and the, 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 the enhanced support for STEM-related sciences. And that's a great first step to reducing the gap that we have and to ensuring that local technologies build up. However, the reality is, to make a difference in science, Africa needs a million researchers working here on African soil. Importantly, 50% of those million researchers should be women. Women who are mothers. <laughs> women who are wives. Women who are waste management scientists, like we heard earlier this week. Women who are molecular bi biologists. Because to make a difference, we have to put women and youth at the center of development. We have to empower them with STEM-related sciences so that all our children can thrive. And as I look around and after everything I've heard this week, it is a difference we can make. Thank you.